I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 23rd of June, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today we are back in the Barrio Fundesi. And yes, it's Barrio, not Reparto. I did look it up. And uh, we are today doing the part of Fundesi over by the baseball field and the universities that butt up against the Barrio of Guadalupe. So we're gonna throw up a map right now, even before we get to the bump, so you can see where we're starting. And we're doing the university areas. We're gonna walk that. We're gonna talk a little bit about power uh, again between Nicaragua and the United States to understand some context. So you've seen the map, you know where we are. Here's the bump, we'll see you right after that. everybody we are back in Fundesi and I have gone if you if you watch my first episode on Fundesi hopefully it wasn't as loud as this I'll do that in a second. we were walking in Ruben Dario Park on the northwest side of the highway putting us in the very corner of Fundesi I've now crossed to the south side of the highway and I'm approaching that corner I'm actually at the university so I wanted to show Unan behind me and I'm gonna pop up a map for y'all so you can see exactly where we are and what we're doing. Uh, you can see kind of where I'm starting. I'm not gonna do all of Fundesi. I said in the last episode, I'm gonna break this up because there's a lot of Fundesi to show. It's an interesting and beautiful area of the city and, and quite different than a lot of the other areas that I show normally. So I wanna get a piece of this. I'm gonna pop this up. So that is the park corner that we are on and that is the intersection. That is the Uno with the Pronto. That is Colonia Universidad, starting right there at that restaurant, I believe. Uh, and you can see the construction of the new stadium up above the Unan building. This is a new university building. The university itself is old. This is the direction we're heading. The university is old and been here for a long time. It is a staple of building Leon as a community. Uh, is the uh, uh, National Autonomous University of Nicaragua. And uh, with the Leo, it's the Leon campus, but it's a very, very big campus here. Uh, it's, it's all throughout the city. And uh, we're gonna go for a walk on this southern portion of Fundesi, or at least what I believe is Fundesi. It's not always crystal clear exactly where the lines are drawn. And if this isn't Fundesi, I'm not sure what it is. I will do my best to figure that out if it's not. Uh, but if it's not Fundesi, it's Fundesi adjacent. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it is a really nice area, um, mostly because it's, it's dominated by the universities and their uh, associated um, um, campuses. Uh, so there's a lot of actual university uh, buildings down here. And there is uh, a lot of like, their baseball field is here. Um, a lot of just open spaces, dormitories, a lot of buildings and, and, and resources for the universities are down here. Uh, but they're not well known in the city because it, it really, somehow they managed to make it feel very apart. So I'm gonna turn around real quickly. And these are steps coming down. So if you come from Ruben Dario Park, that's it, the tall trees across the road is the Ruben Dario that we were in last time. And there's something just making these little tiny flies like crazy over here. They don't do anything, but they fly around your face and they're really annoying. And then there's a beautiful walkway on this side as well. And then we're gonna be below it down here. This is more of the university that we're walking past. So I'm gonna show some of this as we go. What are these? So this is part of the city that is very hidden. And you can see, okay, so I gotta show this. So we have this actual stone wall, the highways over there, we have these tall trees. If you're in the city and driving by, you will really not notice these buildings in this area at all. Like it is blind to the city. It seems like the city uh, just goes into greenery over here um, and that there's actually something here uh, is pretty uh, surprising actually as you're walking along. Um, so this is, one of the monuments, and I don't know what, I mean, it's clearly university, um, but I don't know if these are classrooms or laboratories or what they're used for, uh, but there's, there's a whole region, um, and people mostly just call it the university district, right down here, no one actually tries to identify it, and maybe that's its official name, I don't know. Uh, but this is a nice deep park here. I don't think you can go into it, I think it's just, it, it, this is barbed wire if you can't see it, so it's, it's kind of secluded, but it, it keeps it really 
nice. It's a little bit like a like a light forest zone as we walk along, but uh, makes it really pretty. Um, and there's a lot of dogs in there playing. Interesting. So I've never been down here, right? So while we're walking along, because we have quite some ways, I'll show you how far I'm walking before I get to the very next thing. Uh, there's no turning. There's just a bunch of dogs in the park over there. So a lot of times people ask me, and I did a number of videos about this recently, and I, I probably have done another short that has gone live since the time that I'm recording this, um, about the power situations here. And I keep saying, yes, there are power issues here, but they're mild compared to what I'm used to in the United States. And that's, that's an important thing, because people are often saying, well, I'm, I'm afraid to move there from off in the United States, because I'm worried about the power infrastructure. And... <sighs> You should be worried about the little bugs. No, there's really not normally that many. This is especially bad. And uh, um, and I'm always like, well, yeah, but one of the things I like down here is that, and I can't always put my finger on it, but it seems really easy to deal with the power issues that we have. The power does go out relatively often, but for tiny amounts of time, and there are easy ways to deal with it, such as having uh, generators, which are not that expensive. And of course, one of the things is that you don't need as much power down here for whatever reason. We don't use central air, right? You don't need air conditioning. Um, that's a big thing. And people will immediately say, of course you need air conditioning, it's hot. You don't, it is not like most of the United States. You would like air conditioning generally, but you don't need it in the same way you do in the United States. So I'm from New York and I'm telling you that air conditioning is a luxury that you could live without. I'm not saying you should, but you can, right? Um, now you're gonna want a fan, but fans use a lot less than air conditioning. All right, I wanna turn this a little bit. When I did my last episode, I had shown that walkway up there, and then here is the statue that we're coming up on of Ruben Dario, and that's the highway in between, so you can get a feel of where we are. These, I'm quite confident, are more university buildings right here. I believe we're actually just walking past the edge of campus, and I think we're going to walk into campus. We may actually officially be inside the campus, just a public road portion of it. So I'm going to go into the baseball stadium, I think, well, we're gonna see what this road has for us. We may just head down this road. Why not? All right, all right, you guys are pushing me. I didn't wanna do it, but if, if that's what you guys want, we'll go down this road. This is how I get myself in trouble listening to all of you people who live in my little GoPro box. So, we're walking along. That was the entrance to the baseball stadium. Had I kept going, not stadium, the baseball field, had I gone forward, and we're gonna walk right past it here so you'll see a little bit. The sun is in my eyes, but it kind of makes for good, good lighting, I think. Um, so because, because everything costs so much less here and because you actually need so much less electricity in most cases and because when you're doing things you tend to think more consciously about uh, power and what you're going to do, that was someone else in the road, and uh, so I find in my experience that dealing with power outages here, even if you have a say a four hour outage here or a four hour outage in the United States, I seem to feel like it's easier here. Equal outages feel easier here, but it's just a feel, so I can't say for sure if that's true, um, but it definitely feels that way to me. And uh, more importantly, what I do know is that the outages we have here are uh, more frequent for sure. We have tiny outages or, or really brief outages on a very regular basis, but we don't have really big ones really ever. Uh, we've had basically none since we've been here. So I gotta turn around here and show this is the baseball field for the university. So I talked about this in the last episode. It's a very popular place. People come down, that's literally someone learning how to, to ride a motorcycle and people come down and exercise and stuff. And then I'm gonna turn the camera around this way and show we have, these are dorms for the university. So that's where we are in the midst of things. Uh, so having short outages, sorry, the camera's kind of turned, uh, means it's easy to use things like a UPS or a small generator and have a little tank of gas or whatever and deal with your outages that way. Uh, and, and, and basically the outages become annoying, but not a big deal. And that's only if you're in a situation where you need them. If you have pressurized water in the city, you might be like, I'm just gonna go without power for a little bit, like whatever. It depends on whether you're working, it depends on a lot of things, right? But for the most part, they're not that big of a deal for one reason or another. And there's a big playground down here that I knew nothing about. I love doing these walk arounds because I'm, you know, you guys think I've seen it all. And I like some of these things, I've seen the buildings like this from the road. Uh, and sometimes I've seen things from the road like the baseball, but like this playground, I had no idea. Absolutely no idea that this was here. And it's not like, 
groundbreaking playground or anything, but it's definitely a surprise that it is here. I'm in the way, I'm gonna get run over. <laughs> they gave me the thumbs up and decided not to run me over. That was nice of them. So this is a really nice little park that I knew nothing about. How cool. I can only imagine it is primarily designed for university students with kids because unlike the US, that is super common here. Uh, basically, you almost assume that university kids are going to have kids, both because people have children much younger here. I'm gonna show this, this is campus over here. That's the cultural center just behind there with the traditional, uh, I don't know what they're, from the ballet that we saw the other day. And then this is, a, these are standards throughout the country. So first of all, that's another cool bit of the playground there. Nice, I had no idea. So all, all a surprise. Um, and then these huge structures like this are used to, to keep rain and stuff off of baseball, or baseball, basketball all over the country. So we see these in, in cities all over and they always look so grand. And you're like, what cool thing could that be? It's like, yeah, it's basketball. Like, uh, oh, well, okay. Seems like overkill, but there you have it. Uh, so both, you have uh, people who have children much younger here. The average age of having your first kid is dramatically younger than in the US. And the age of going to university here is much higher. In the US, there's a constant push uh, to move the university ages down. Um, so you're, when I was in school, it was like unheard of uh, to go to university before you were 17. And, and it was super rare to do it at 17. Um, and you would pretty much always start university at 18 because you generally wouldn't be able to graduate until you were at least 17 and quite a bit. Um, being able to graduate high school before that was very, very hard. Then, since then, they started doing this, well, you get to do a couple years of university while you're in high school and they've moved the high school ages down and now it's easy to graduate early and all kinds of things. So now you have people who are graduating at 16 with a two-year degree already. And so they're way, way ahead and, and like, People who are, who are many years ahead of that are just more and more common, right? So it's becoming a completely different thing. So in the US, it's not unheard of to have college graduates at 18, 19 years old. And here, it's not unheard of to have people starting college until 22 and then taking four or five years to do it. So it's a, a gap in the ages of the people you're expecting to matriculate by between eight and 10 years for the most part. So you add to that a dramatically lower age of having kids, it's almost like a 15 year age difference in what you think of. So in the United States, we think of uh, university students as being children, very, very much children, often not legally allowed even to drive, and that's legit. And here we think of university students as very much adults who have been adults and have been having kids of their own and have been in the workforce and have been making life decisions and doing stuff and living on their own. Maybe not living, living on their own because people live with their parents until they're quite old, typically, but, but going through the life of an adult for many years before they're in university. So having playgrounds at a university like that makes a lot of sense. So I just wanna show this is more of university down here. So this is the wall of the cemetery on this side, which there's a lot of uh, the university and the cemetery share a lot of space down here. as uh, the cemetery of Guadalupe. And then this is all the campus over here. And then there's this surprisingly modern building on this corner all by itself that doesn't match anything in the area. Um, that is painted as if it was meant to be a government office when it was put in. That is the government color, um, which I'm not a fan of, but you do notice it like, from anywhere, you're like, wait, wait, that's a government office. Um, but that is not recently painted, so I think that is a faded government office, and now it is like a copy center where you can get like copies made and use a computer or something. So very interesting. Anyway, um, and I saw people going into it. Like clearly it's, a, it's an operating business and they have a nicely tended garden out front uh, and nothing on the side. This is um, another university here showing that it's right there at the end of the street. So one of the things that we have here um, is Un Unan is the main university, right? It is by far the biggest and the best known, but this area is absolutely covered in universities and they, uh, many of them are butting up against each other. So you can walk from campus to campus um, and they share a zone, which is kind of nice that there's a lot of shared resources. So all the student housing is shared between the universities, not the dorms, but the student housing, like, like public, or I'm sorry, private student housing. People will operate uh, places specifically for that uh, commonly. 
and uh, if you like the copy center, right? A lot of students might need those resources. That's shared between all the universities. The, f the baseball field, for all I know, is shared between the universities, and that's where we are. Kind of turn this around. You can see the main road up there heading into Guadalupe. That is Fundesi, uh, those trees over there, and Guadalupe is right in front of us. This is an interesting little area. This is a nice walk. So back to the power. I get distracted pretty easily, sorry. This is what, you guys have asked for me to get out and walk more and I ramble while I meander. So both my topic and my feet just kind of meander through Nicaragua. That, that is how it works. Um, so, uh, so, so because the power outages tend to be brief and because we tend to use less, it's, it's really easy, I find, to mitigate power outages here. And we've done a number of episodes on that. In the United States, I kept talking about how there have been these really major power outages. Hola. Hola. And it's, it's really often a problem because the outages are longer than you can withstand with a generator. They're much longer than you can handle going uh, with just waiting it out. Because here, we really never worry about our refrigerator's thawing, or our freezer's thawing. Uh, I did have a power outage the other day that was so long that I did have some ice cream melt. But it didn't go bad, just some ice cream melted so it became kind of goopy. We still ate it, it was fine, right? But it, it lost a little bit. You could tell that it had thawed. Um, so there's a little bit, it can happen, but we're not having our food go bad. When I lived in the United States, our food went bad. Right, that was a real thing. In winter, our food would go bad. Right, we would we would have to talk about throwing our food outside in the hopes of saving it. Right, like the, those kinds of things were regular, and we had to do all kinds of crazy things to keep our house from freezing. We had to burn things in the house. We had to run the oven wide open when there was power because we knew that when there wasn't power, we would get so cold that everything would freeze, and like we were risking hypothermia inside the house. All kinds of really crazy situations when it's super cold. And that brings me to right now, as I'm recording this, as I got out of the car to come record this, I read that uh, Texas is currently at a heat index of 125, which is they're in a record heat wave and the power is once again failing. Now, when I lived there, the power failed because it got too cold. Now it is failing because it got too hot. They've had years since I've been there to fix these issues, but because of some of the most extreme governmental corruption you've ever seen, there's no way for anybody to put pressure on the people who apparently answer to no one about the power to keep people safe. The government doesn't have the right to oversee them because of their desire to make things private companies. They've left everyone in a situation where a private company controls everything and it answers to no one and can literally raise the price based on their own failures. So they're incentivized financially to fail because they make more money by failing. It's crazy. We don't have that here. <laughs> here, the power company has a job and it is to get power to the people and help make the country run. And it does so. It makes mistakes, it has bad days, it gets hits with hurricanes, whatever, but our outages are relatively minor. Right now, Texas is looking at, again, a collapse of the power system. It's only at the moment tens of thousands without power, but tens of thousands at life-threatening heat wave where air conditioning is absolutely necessary. It is worth noting a number of things. One is that we never have power failures of that type here. There's no record of it. No one knows of one. It's just not a thing that happens. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. The second thing is that we don't get uh, heat waves like that. I'm not saying it's impossible. That would be inviting disaster. But in general, these things do not happen. That is not something you have to worry about when you live in Nicaragua. Our hot days could hit a heat index of 105, maybe which is still hot, but it is a far cry from 125. Both our index and our raw numbers don't come close to places that we generally consider somewhat moderate in the United States. I've been at 117 degrees on the East Coast, relatively far north. Texas, where I lived, is at 125 right now as an index. These are life-threatening temperatures, and especially in places that don't have that all the time. If you're in a Phoenix and you hit 125, people are like, well, it's a hot day. Right? Everyone's prepared for it. <coughs> Everyone knows that they're going to have to deal with it. And it's dry. So as long as you have enough water, you're probably going to survive. Most people, anyway. But in Texas, 
where it is humid, that heat index is absolutely crippling. And if you're like me, I'm even more affected by the heat index uh, than most people. Um, it would be like a heat index of 130, 135. For me, it would be absolutely terrible. So it's interesting or awful in a way, but it's interesting that we're having the same issue that I talked about just before I left Texas. And just as people were asking me about the power here, it's happening again. They're looking at long-term power grid failures throughout many states in the South while they're in a absolutely life-threatening heat index scenario. And that combination is the worst, right? And it's terrible for the people who live there, um, but it's as we're just looking at what your risks are, when people are like, I don't know about moving to Nicaragua, I'm worried about stop and say, wait, I should be thrilled, and I realize you don't know all the factors, but the answer should be, I'm so glad I'm moving to Nicaragua where the, the electric does not have these catastrophic failures in that way. Yes, we talk about our outages on a regular basis. On the day that I was talking about this, I talked about how they were gonna shut off the power in my house. They didn't, by the way, they just said they were going to, which is weird. Sometimes they get told and then they just like, ah, we decided not to. Um, but, but that was just my house and my neighbor's house because my neighbor actually had his, his personal line caught on fire. Uh, so they, they needed to shut the power off to protect it. They ended up being able to just shut his off. That wasn't a, a, a power company or grid failure or anything like that. Anyone can have their neighbor catch on fire. Um, but I'm walking by the cemetery right here. We're technically in Guadalupe now. We stepped just past the intersection, which I'm gonna show in a minute. Uh, but you end up with this scenario where, oh, I just gotta show this. So this is like a little park as part of the university system. This is the, and this is the kiosk Guadalupe. So each of these little buildings can turn into a little restaurant or pulperia or whatever. And they normally sell food, but they could sell like snacks or drinks or whatever. Uh, some of them are closed. It's not a very active time of day, but you can see a lot of students are over there. And then this is U to M over here on the corner. So all kinds of transportation coming by. Oh, they just hit that motorcycle. My gosh, they hit it with the opening doors, not with the bus itself. They had the door open and ran into it. Wow, I hope I got that on camera. I don't think that I did, but very caught me by surprise. That's why you don't park on the corner, people. So anyway, so this is a little park where a lot of students hang out. And uh, this is the University of Managua here on the corner, which is one of the big campuses in this region. Uh, it's a really beautiful campus here. And this intersection that we had just walked up, I wanna show a little bit closer. We have, buenas tardes. We have a Puma gas station here. Almost no one uses this one, I say, as a lot of people pull in. But it's right here in Guadalupe, and then this is the university district we just came from. And then this road is goes right through Guadalupe and goes right to the Basilica in uh, downtown Leon. So what you often do, and I do this almost every time I'm driving, and I'll do it in a minute when I'm done with this video, we're gonna come from down here. That is the Ruben Dario Park that we st showed in the other episode and at the beginning of this one. You would drive down here, take this turn, and head that way and go right into downtown Leon. And if you're going to be going out to the beaches, you would still go down that way, but you would turn before you hit all the way downtown. And uh, 4th Street in the south is the one that cuts all the way through to take you out to the beaches. So that is uh, that is the roads here. If you're heading the other way, uh, this is a one way going that way. There's a one way coming the other way right over there. So just one street over, you would come up and then come down along the cemetery and the same thing, you would head out. And so that is the way to go to Managua. <laughs> all right, so we lost the camera because it overheated and I didn't get a chance to come back out and record for a few days. So I was standing, just to give you context, I was standing right there in that intersection next to the Puma, pointing this way when the battery went out. So I'm walking past U to M right now, the University of Managua, which it looks awfully closed to me. I don't know what's going on, but it's overgrown and nothing particularly looks opened or manned. I also wanna show these signs. So this is a problem in Nicaragua. The sun is pretty intense and the signs for everything tend to burn out. So who knows what these signs are for? I do remember that that was legible when we first moved here. And I wanna show this sign. I think I mentioned this at some point. In some of my videos, I show in, uh, in Sutiava that there is this lotification that never got anywhere and there's a sign for it, lotification San Luis. And here's another sign for it. Now the lotification itself is located on the Ponaloya Road 
and there's not a single thing sold. It's basically just a field. Someone stuck a sign in it, tried to sell things for $5,000 a parcel with $56 a month. And here on the far side of the city is another sign. These signs have clearly been here for years. Someone put in all this effort putting in these signs and never sold a single lot, never built the road, never did anything. Just, it's ridiculous. And, but, and then the signs remain because no one ever removes them. Uh, so this is the soccer field here at U to M. See the sidewalk coming by that. We're gonna walk around the corner with that and go down the road behind it. And we're gonna uh, call it a day here in the university area. But uh, so, so this is just in general, all these universities come together uh, and this intersection that we've already talked about this, but I'm gonna turn the camera again. I'm walking from Fundesi. So U of M here, which is a beautiful building. They have a really nice, a small, but a very nice campus here. But you can tell this does not look kept up and you don't see anyone inside. You see nothing going on. Now, I don't know if this is a day when there would be school or anything like that, but it does not give you any impression of someone having been here any time recently. And I don't just mean someone maintaining it. I mean, it doesn't look like anyone's been here. It feels abandoned, but it's such a beautiful spot in the middle of the city. It's hard to believe that something isn't going on with it. Who knows, but it's a, it's a spot that needs to be used. Okay, so this is U of M, and that is the Puma gas station across the street. And obviously not having this school active here not only wastes a beautiful campus, it also makes it much harder for businesses to survive in this part of the city because the universities are what make it possible. That is the cemetery of Guadalupe across the street. So that side of the street over there is Guadalupe. This side is Fundesi. The universities are mostly in Fundesi as far as I can tell and spill over into Guadalupe, but there's some on both sides. So this area where they come together, this is the, the center of the universities. All of Leon is full of universities. That is a, a general thing. As you go through downtown, there's universities spread all throughout the city. Um, many different ones, some are Unan. They have a big campus downtown. Uh, Ukan is all over the city, although I don't know if that one's currently open. Uh, U of M here, UCC, uh, Occidental has a small building in the city and then it has a, a, uh, a larger campus quite a ways outside the city that we were hoping to go to sometime uh, relatively soon and we didn't manage to go but a friend of ours just won Miss University Occidental uh, and we were, we were hoping to get to film that but we didn't get information on it in time. Show a little bit more of this campus here. This really is I mean, quite small, obviously. I'm walking past it pretty quickly, but it's got these beautiful statues, this beautiful fencing and design. Gorgeous tree at the top of the stairs. It's a very pleasant campus. This would be a great location, and it's a nice part of the city, but it's just completely empty. Now, there is a guard in there right now, so maybe it's just closed at the moment. It is often hard to tell in Nicaragua when things have been abandoned or when it's just not a lot of gardening going on and uh, really quickly you have tons of leaves come down and uh, weeds grow up. I mean, it can take just a few weeks of things being closed and you'll be like, oh, no one's ever been there. And then they open it up and you're like, oh, oh, that, no, that's just what it looks like. So it's not always easy to tell. So at the moment, I'm just heading one street back. I'm heading north, right? So Fundesi and Guadalupe are at the south end of Leon and I'm walking north towards the Basilica and downtown at El Centro and I'm going to go out and get some video of this. I got to wait for the traffic and I'm going to jump over to the Guadalupe side of the road and show what we have here. Actually this is perfect. It's going to be very hard to see down the street but I can go with impunity down the street because the street is closed and he did not pay attention. He was too busy looking at me and didn't notice the closed street. So this is Pali. This is one of our grocery store chains here. This is the part of uh, Walmart. I show them all the time. This street, which is obviously torn up, leads directly to downtown. And I hope you can see it on the GoPro here. It's a beautiful sight. Straight down the road is the Basilica. So this road leads there. And Guadalupe is the barrio that exists directly south of the Basilica. All right, we're going to head back to the Fundesi side and keep exploring. This is not a, not a super exciting road. I've been down this before. But this is the U of M campus there on this block. So as we were talking earlier about power, the, the real takeaway is that power events, in my experience, 
in Nicaragua, while they occur, and they're, they're not unheard of, and they're going to happen, and happen more often, right? I'm not saying they don't happen more often. We get more power outages than in the U.S., but the severity of them, the impact of them, the amount you need to worry about them is far less, and the ability to trivially or easily mitigate the risk by having batteries, good planning, different hardware, different thought processes will make it that you can pretty easily just deal with it. Now, that being said, I talked to Alan yesterday and he's definitely ready to go out and buy a generator. But what does a generator cost? So here in Nicaragua, we bought ours and I believe I have the price right. We bought ours for about $550 and ours is a dual gasoline and uh, uh, compressed gas generator so we can flip back and forth and a single one generates enough power that we can run all the central services at our hotel or at the house and we actually own two of them so we can put one at either but we currently have them at the hotel not at the house and uh, it's that simple $550 now that's not a small investment but when you're talking about a a kind of savings that you have when moving to Nicaragua versus the United States, right? It's conceivable that you will save more than $550 in a single month's worth of rent. It's also conceivable that you will save $550 in two or three months worth of power reduction or power bill reduction. In doing so, you could pay for a generator really, really quickly through very large savings and go from being at risk of severe power outages and high cost and all these really big complexities they are very hard to deal with to a situation where power outages are, yes, common, but not very impactful, very easy to deal with. And if you're in that small group of people who need to have unlimited power and just have to have a generator, which is some of you, right? It's me, it's Alan, like we work from home. We have huge dependencies on being able to keep the power on. So for me, if the power's out a really long time, I go to the beach. For Alan, you know, and Alan and I can go to each other's house quite often, outages do not span the whole city. So we mitigate that way. There's so many ways that we're able to mitigate. Look at this beautiful place that does nails. Nice. And in having options and in thinking through what you're going to do when the power's out it is so easy to come up with affordable solutions that give you a better situation at far less money than you're used to in the u.s that's really what we're saying right it's yes on the show we talk about power outages all the time one of the reasons we talk about power outages so much i have offices all over the country so if managua loses power that affects me if chinandega loses power that affects me if leon loses power that affects me if the beach loses power that affects me if a lot of people have power outages i'll notice right so we're often talking about power outages that don't affect us when you're in the united states and this is all i can't figure out why this is so different but when you're in the u.s you generally only worry about a power outage if it's impacting you and very few people in the u.s run out and make videos every time the power goes out but here if the power goes out anywhere i'm likely to mention it so you get a feeling like there's a lot more power outages than than it seems like there are if you just live here what are this? All right. We are coming through real fundesi at this point. And kids playing soccer on the porch there. All right. We are going to, we're going to call it a day. And we've done the university area. I need to get the light back. There we go. That's much better. We've done the university area. And on our next fundesi episode, which is coming up, in several days it's gonna be a little bit because uh, we've got we've got some cool footage for you guys uh, we're gonna be tackling uh, a series on housing in Fatima uh, which you've already seen some but we've got a total of three houses that are all the same price and we're gonna compare those so you can see what $500 will get you in Fatima in three very different ways uh, we've done a house uh, that's much much cheaper in Saragossa so you can see something completely different there we've done a house on the beach that's not available for normal rent it's available well I guess it is but it's meant as a party house so it's meant to be 
rented by the weekend. Uh, we've been doing walks in Fundesi. We're getting more and more stuff. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. So stay tuned. We're gonna be we're gonna be back in Fundesi in several days, and we're gonna be taking uh, over from where I am right now, which is in what the Americans or the British would call the projects. This is an area where there are very few cars. I'm gonna to try to go through some of the areas that have uh, no, no traffic at all, because uh, it's pedestrian only, and show some of this portion of Fundesi uh, in our next episode. So, be back with you guys in a few days here in Fundesi, but I'll see all of you tomorrow from the show. So please like and subscribe if you like to support the channel. You can buy me a coffee at the link up above at buymeacoffee.com slash Miller. As always, if you're interested in assistance with relocation to Nicaragua, shoot us an email at info at relocatenicaragua.com. Please post on social media. Take these episodes, just grab the link from the top, stick it onto a Twitter uh, tweet, just put it on a Facebook post, put it in a group that you're talking to, stick it on Reddit and say, hey, here's something cool to check out. Wherever you're having conversations with people, just throw these links up there and uh, tell them about the show. If you've got friends, family who are wondering about Nicaragua, they want to know what it is you're looking at, send them the show. Let them know about us. That's how we get the word out. We've had some amazing growth. By the time this is live, we may be pushing 4,000 subscribers, which is fantastic. We've been hovering around 100,000 views per month uh, recently, which is amazing. I think we've been holding that actually for an entire month, uh, which is just amazing. Um, so thank you to everyone who's making this all so, so possible. And I will see all of you manana. <laughs>